Welcome to Careers Unwrapped, where we delve into real life career stories from successful people who've been through it all, the ups and the downs. We'll get their raw, honest, actionable advice and be the careers talk they wish they'd had when they started out. As someone who has had a varied career, from soldier to salesman, expedition leader to entrepreneur, he knows firsthand that your career doesn't always lead you where you expect it to. Here's your host, Mark Fawcett. So hello and welcome to Careers and Rat. I'm your host, Mark Fawcett, and with me today are two people, Marion Miranda and Joe Sayer. They're copywriter and art director at the Leith Agency in Glasgow and in Manchester. Now, they're also recent joint gold winners of the Cannes Young Lions print competition, which is a big, big deal in the world of advertising. I'm sure we'll get on to that. They're hopefully going to be talking about how they've developed their creative careers, working together in a partnership, and also the lessons that they've learned along the way. So Marion and Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. I, I think let's, let's get down to the basics straight away. Art director role, copywriter role. What is each of those and, and who does what in the work you do together? So we, we're kind of like a creative partnership. Um, our directors traditionally work with copywriters to come up with kind of creative campaigns and ideas and then flesh that out and see what way you can take it. But the art director traditionally does the visual side of it. Um, so coming up with how an ad would look and then the copywriter would come up with the words and what you're saying on it. But it, it kind of blends quite a lot. We do each other's job quite a lot of the time, which is quite nice because we have kind of different backgrounds. But as a partnership, you always have to kind of uh, work together on that. Uh, they say the best art directors can write and the best copywriters can visualize. So we do try to do a bit of that with each other. And uh, Marin, when did you start down the role of being a writer? How did that skill start to develop and you start thinking, actually, I'm quite good at this? Um, I entered... I started as a copywriter by chance, so I actually have a background in fine art. So when I graduated, I just wanted a creative job and the job description that sounded the most interesting uh, was uh, was to work for a social media agency. And so I just joined as a copywriter and took the chance to do that. And they took a chance on you as well. And that was the role that started you off then in, in this career path? Yeah, um, my creative director said um, I was the only copywriter with a portfolio with artwork. So it was a bit strange to to hire someone for a writing role, but with artwork. But, you know, I when I did my artwork, writing was always involved. So so I always, you know, I just wanted to do a creative job and I don't see a writing and visuals as separate. And and Joe, your your pathway then from from sort of starting out, what got you first of all thinking about the more visual side of creative that that led you into the art director role? I think it's actually similar to Marion. I didn't kind of fell into advertising. I didn't even consider it as a as a job role when because I did graphic design at uni. And although it sounds like a that would make sense to to go into advertising and be an art director, it's kind of like it seemed like a world apart when I was younger kind of advertising has a bit of a bad rep and I didn't want to do advertising. You kind of ignore advertising in all of your life a lot of the time. So I kind of wanted to do the kind of craft side of it, um, the graphic design side of it, the pure typography and layout and stuff. But I think that's actually really helped me because although we do the kind of um, the ideas side of it, it does help to kind of have the craft of typography and layout um, behind it um, at all times. But I think I had a relatively traditional way into advertising from that. And perhaps bring it to life a little bit now for people who don't know the work, don't know the industry at all. What have you got on your, what have you got in your tray for the week ahead? What clients are you working on? What are the, the challenges and work you're doing right now? So Joe and I are on the health team at least. So that means all our clients are related to health, whether they're in pharma or cancer research, things like that. So our projects can range from as simple as a LinkedIn post for a client to a big 360 campaign for the Paralympics about disease awareness. So every day is kind of different. We get a creative brief and in that brief, it lines out what you have to do for each client and it's different every day. And what, Marin, is your process then? You mentioned a brief, which is obviously a start point for a lot of both 
advertising work, but also wider marketing work as well. You get the brief, it arrives in an email. What do the two of you do next? What's your process? Um, I think we, well, we kind of understand the, the brief. Um, you have to read the brief and understand the brief, but then because we work remotely, it's different. So people usually going into the industry would be literally sat together in a room. Um, you're reading the brief, you're kind of talking about it. It can be quite awkward sometimes when you're that with someone and you're constantly, you're trying to think, you're trying to concentrate, but you also feel like you have to be talking about it. You don't have your own kind of headspace. So I quite like the fact that we re work remotely because you can come together when you want to come together. Um, so it's quite nice. So you read the brief, we might then have a chat about it on, on a call. Um, and then you just kind of start throwing ideas at each other. It could be a sketch. It could be a, a sentence. It could be a, a thought that doesn't make any sense. It could be, it could be the worst idea possible, but then you're trying to make that into the, the best idea possible, which is sometimes a, a fun way to do it. Um, and then, and then you kind of share that with the team after that. Yeah. I've, I've been faced with briefs before where you read it and immediately your, your brain starts sort of firing and sparking and you think, hang on, I can see ideas. I can see direction, stretch coming out of this, as opposed to the brief that you read and then you read again and you're going, there's nothing. <laughs> I'm blank here. How do, how do you trigger the ones that perhaps don't flow so easily from you for a creative process or, or if you get a pushback from your colleagues or from the client, how do you trigger the ones that aren't working for you? And we face this quite a lot because of the nature of the clients we have because it's all health. So it can be quite serious or it can be quite complicated. So the first step is always to, to research a bit. And from the research, you will find images and stories that you can always draw on. So that's one way. Or if we do get stuck, um, I think we do look at past work um, online and, you know, just try to draw inspiration from other people's work or work we've done before. And, you know, you just try to, it's like a puzzle that you just have to solve. And I think we rarely get stuck. We just keep going. It's the nature of our work and it's what we enjoy really. And working together as a partnership, as a pair, Joe, you said that there's a lot of positives out of working remotely. How often do you actually get together in the same place? We, we, we do. I go up to um, Edinburgh quite a lot, up to the Leith office, because um, that's where the bulk of people are. So I do that um, every so often. And then it's quite nice to kind of spend some time with each other and talk about things that aren't work as well. Um, so it's it kind of usually that we, um, apart from that, it's pretty much always remotely. Um, and we, the fun, the funny thing about when we went to Cannes is that we had had, we only met each other in person twice. And then we had a week in Cannes working on a brief together. So that was quite interesting, but it makes it fun. It means you can, when you do see each other, you can catch up and talk about real things, in real life rather than work. We also see each other during shoots. So, so. If we do have a big shoot, we would both tra travel to where it's being made and, and work together then. So maybe four times a year, we see each other. That, that seems a very few because of the work you do, because of the way that you combine in, in the creative process. But you mentioned then about Cannes. So uh, for those who don't know, Cannes is obviously known for some of its big festivals, the, the film festival being one of the, the biggest there, but also has a, a massive uh, festival for, for the advertising market globally. And you won a, a really big deal prize there after I think winning a UK version of it and then being sent over. But it wasn't a prize for work you'd been doing over the previous year. It was a prize for a brief that you were set while you were there with, I think, just about 24 hours to, to come up with a solution. So just talk us through what the brief was and, and um, what you came out with. Um, so so the, the brief was set by this company called EcoTree, and they had quite an interesting proposition. So, you know, you, businesses and people, they, they can donate and plant a tree. But what was different about them was that every time you plant a tree, you're actually making an investment. So as the tree grows, so does your profit over time. So that was um, its unique sort of selling proposition. And they were struggling to communicate that. So the 24-hour brief was to try and solve it in a single print visual. How can you communicate the fact that your profit grows when you 
plant a tree or buy a tree. Um, so that that was the brief. Uh, Joe, you want to take take them through how you how we came up with it? Yeah. So our our idea it, it's strange because you have to come up with the idea. You have twenty four hours, so you have to come up basically be sure on the idea the evening that you're briefed because then you have to execute the idea the next day. So you essentially only have like a few hours to be sure of what you're doing and then you can sleep on it and then kind of execute it because otherwise you're just scrambling for nonsense ideas the next day. So the idea that we came up with was to use tree rings because everyone knows the idea of tree rings and that they um, represent time. So, and it's a beautiful visual. So we used a shot of tree rings and then on each tree ring, we kind of showed the number um, the number of euros going up. So the amount of money going up with each kind of ring. And the idea was, is that, um, as your tree grows, so does your profit. So it was a data visualization piece, as it were. It's kind of quite a kind of straight way of doing it, but in a visually interesting way, which I think the simplicity of it helped, uh, rather than kind of going over the top, it does explain what they do in a simple, visually striking way, I think. And then ultimately you won, uh, which was a global competition for 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 younger people starting out in in the industry how did you find out that you won and was there a ceremony was a prize giving cans known for its its parties and its events and we we were all sort of gathered in this like uh, outdoor space and they they made the announcements and so all the people involved in the competition were just waiting you we didn't know whether you won or not and then they just um they read out the winners, I think we were the first ones to, uh, the, the first category to be read that was the print category. So the announcement was made and I don't know, we just we couldn't quite believe it. We were like, did we hear it? Did we hear it right? I don't know. And then we just, we just got up on stage and got our certificates and yeah, we were just thinking, oh no, what, what do we do next? It's quite a sudden, uh, sudden announcement and the award ceremony, I think was on the same night. So we had to kind of scramble and um, get changed and go and get our award. I think we, we were in such a rush. We like grabbed a quick McDonald's before, <laughs> before going to the ceremony because we had no time to eat. I, I like that. Big time party and can awards. Quick, grab a McDonald's on the way. Was there a party that evening? Was it a good event? <laughs> was it a lot of fun? And so then you're, you're back in... Yeah, so you're back from Cannes in the in the sort of reality of work. What I, one thing I'm interested in is a lot of your works around print advertising, and in fact, your your award uh, Cannes was for for a print ad. What are you finding is happening in terms of changes in print advertising in an increasingly digital world? I mean, in terms of like print, the the word print, there is a lot less print in general, obviously, because we're going to more more screens than digital. But the the idea of getting one visual to represent a lot of like one idea is still kind of what you aim to do. So I guess even if you like wanted to do a big campaign that's never going to be used for print, you always want to sum it up in one key visual. You always want to sum it up as if it's print. So we'd almost still do a print execution um, of an idea first, even if it's not going to ever be used as print, if that makes sense. So the, the principle still is there, but obviously there is a lot more digital and and kind of tiny little five centimeters squ uh, square on your screen is now the now the new format and it's like yeah we we wouldn't want to do that as much but that's how it is you kind of have to go with that really and along the way who who's taught you these skills I th I'd be interested now for each of you and perhaps Marion if you'd go first the the individuals along the way who've either taught you directly or influenced or mentored you who who's been there for you on this journey so far? Um, my first job was with a social media agency, and um, that was a big learning experience because we were only a team of five, so it was a small business, and you had to do a bit of everything. I had to pitch for new business, had to direct films, produce films do visuals and write at the same time. So so you were doing a bit of everything and that was almost my crash course in advertising and my creative director there was, you know, was my mentor and still continues to be. And and then coming to Leith, it's a different game because it's bigger and it had, uh, well, compared to where I was before, it's much bigger. And you have teams that specialize in helping you make make the work better and achieve a certain quality that I never had a chance to achieve before. So um, both 
both of these agencies have been very instrumental in teaching me uh, how to like do the best work I can do. I'd say that it, it's hard to tell how much of an influence kind of university has as well, especially when you learn so much more when you're on the job. So it's kind of hard to gauge how much you did learn at uni. I think you definitely learn a huge amount more when you're on the job and it's like, because everything's so, um, so quick and you're doing so many more things that in a short space of time that you did at uni. But I think obviously the creative directors and the, the, the people that are above you in each agency are, are hugely important. Um, I've had really good ones and really horrendous ones, which is really nice to see both. Because if you don't have the really horrible ones, you don't know who the really good ones are. So it's a really nice way of gauging that, to be honest. I, I'm not going to ask you to name the really horrible one because, you know, it's, it's, it's not a massive industry. But, I, but I'm interested, especially on, from the perspective of others who will be starting out in their careers. What are the aspects of somebody who wasn't great to you? What are the bits you're thinking when you're describing them that way? Was it them as a leader, as a manager, or as a creative? As a creative, they were brilliant, but it was not kind of, it was when I was quite young um, and they don't um, kind of value you as a, as a kind of almost like a grad. Um, they kind of wanted too much from you too quickly um, and they were quite dismissive as you. as like, they basically didn't want to teach you. They just wanted you to understand immediately. It's like, oh, that's not how it works. You need to teach me, otherwise, why are you employing me as a young person? Like, employ someone else, but... Um, I don't think they even realized, to be honest. I don't know if they have learned from that yet, but yeah. And in terms of learning and teaching, you're, you're obviously still very much in that process. And I mean, I, I very much find I'm still learning and hope I continue to do so forever. But I'm interested to know what you might have learned from each other since you came together as a, as a partnership. I don't know if, Joe, you're able to, to explain what maybe you've actually picked up from, from Marion. Marion, um, it's quite, it is nice that she comes from a fine art background because she almost has a perspective on my role as well. So we obviously come up with ideas, like we said before, that we do each other's job sometimes. Um, I think Marion is also really good at coming up with completely different ideas that you, you need different perspectives. If you're the same kind of person, kind of pointless being in a team, like what's the point if you're both um, have that kind of idea or that kind of thinking behind it. So Marion's, it is really good to have completely different ways of thinking about it. I can be sometimes too logical and then Marion can actually be kind of a bit out there with some ideas. So I think that's really helpful. And, and Marion, the, the same question over to you really in terms of what you have learned from Joe since you've, you've partnered up with him. Yeah, I think Joe's got quite a lot of traits that a good creative director has in that he knows when an idea is working and how to refine it. Sometimes I can maybe like throw 10 ideas in a deck and they're like half baked and they're really strange or, and Joe's really good at, you know, saying, no, that's rubbish. And that one's really good. And that, so, so he kind of, he's a really good filter. And, uh, in general, I think, uh, his quality in art direction because of his design background is so good as well. So I do. I do think I'm learning about how to refine uh, my work and make it like uh, higher quality uh, since partnering with Joe. And how how strong do you both think you are at uh, what's the right way to say it? at at killing off the ideas that that really don't have any further to go? Because you know if you're both suggesting ideas it, and you work closely together, sometimes you get your your mind saying that idea is just not going to work. But you've got to keep working together. You've got to be friendly. So, how good are you at being able to to just say we're not taking that any further? I think both of us don't take like don't take ourselves too seriously. So it's we don't really care if something's rejected or if something's not working. We just try it, and uh, I think we're polite enough to to tell each other when it's not working. And a creative director also helps if if we're not sure. Yeah, you get you get better and better. You get you get better and better at um, being more brutal with each other's ideas as you as you get to know each other more. Because at the start, it is you, we we never worked with each other before, Leith. So you do have to be careful about you have to democratic about right. We'll we'll, we'll figure that idea out, even if it's be not sure it's right. But then as you get kind of work work with each other a bit more, you can be more like that idea is just not good. 
or we say to each other and because other, otherwise you just run out of time, to be honest. Now, a number of people listening to this may have something, look, I, I want to try myself. I want to see if I can get into this type of work. I believe I'm creative. The advertising industry interests me. But historically, a lot of it's been centered in London and you two aren't. Uh, I've read a piece that came out uh, when it was talking about your awards, about ways to support young talent coming into the industry. What are your thoughts about, well, let's start with the industry itself first. What could the industry be doing more of or doing better in order to help find and support young talent from all sorts of backgrounds? I think there is more work being done these days to get people from different backgrounds into advertising. I think people are realizing it's like getting a bit of a weird bubble of if you're advertising to normal people, you need more normal people in advertising, otherwise it's kind of pointless. And I think there's more work do it, being done with that. Leaf is part of a, um, a strategy to get more people in from different backgrounds, going to different high schools in Scotland and in Manchester. Um, so that's really good. It needs to be done because people from different backgrounds need to realize it is um, a career because people just haven't got a clue. People just think advertising is just annoying <laughs> and it can be great fun. Marion, what, what do you think in terms of what the industry can do? I think, I mean, especially after COVID and with the cost of living crisis, very few people can afford to live in London and the bulk of agencies are there. So it would be good if they're more open to remote working. I mean, Joe and I work remotely and we travel maybe four or five times a year and that's not a big cost. So if they were open to remote working and maybe sponsoring travel when you do need them in London, that, that would be good for those for those agencies. And yeah, just in general to to understand that, that people can afford to to move and to live in, in this city in, in the city these days. And if you were in a position to be talking to let's say a, a room full or a screen full of people thinking that's the direction I want to go in. I want to work as a creative in the advertising industry. What advice, based on your own experience and knowledge now, what advice would you give to them, Marion? I think younger people have a huge advantage over us in that they uh, understand TikTok and Snapchat and they know how to create content on there. There is a huge gap in advertising where we don't, we're not truly embracing social media. So I would say if you are a creative person to start creating content on the platforms that you are familiar with, that you grew up with, because that, you know, we're going to need people. We do need people right now who are uh, specialists, uh, well, who understand these platforms and we're just going to keep needing them more and more as we go on. And Joe, advice from you, perhaps? I guess it's not really advice, but it's just kind of more um, to get people into it is that it can be really fun. It's a, it can be a super fun job, um, really satisfying, really fun, really creative. And you do enjoy it a lot. I enjoy what I do a lot. A lot of people can't say that. Um, and people don't realize that it is a really creative job. People, when people think about creative jobs, they don't think about going into advertising immediately. Um, yeah, it's just, it, it can be really fun if you're in, in the right place, obviously, but there's, and obviously there's a lot of variety in what we do and each job is completely different. And in terms of your own creative ambitions, is there work out there, relatively recent work, let's say that you look at and you think, I wish I'd done that. I wish I'd received that brief. Any sort of brand pieces that, that listeners might have seen themselves that you put up there as, as gold standard? Um, the, the first example I always think of was quite long ago. I think, and I saw it years ago, it was a campaign by Stabilo, the highlighter brand. So it was Highlight the Remarkable was their campaign. And what they did was they took historical images and they highlighted the character in the background who uh, was a woman and who uh, contributed to, to the cause. Uh, so I, I saw that and I thought, you know, it's, it's something that makes me look at historical images differently now because you start to look at the people in the background rather than in the foreground. And it was just a clever way to, to advertise their product, which was a highlighter. So something quite simple could be quite profound. And that always left a, a lasting impression on me. 
But I think that's that is often the case, isn't it? In that something that is executed so simply that anybody from any background, any age can just get it straight away uh, can be incredibly powerful. And Joe, I wonder if there's an example from you two of work that you just think is outstanding that maybe you'd wish you'd been part of. Well, the the whole of being at, being at Cannes for for a week isn't just the um, isn't just the competition. It was also you're there for the week long festival of seeing um, basically the world's best creative work, and the whole place is just covered in amazing work that you're um, kind of envious of and jealous of making. Which is why it's which kind of better than the competition is the fact that you're you go there and you just think, oh God, like why have I not made this kind of stuff? Why I want to make be making this, and it, it does make a lasting impression. Could you go to awards evenings and you see who's won the best in each competition, in each category, um, each evening. And then if you go into kind of the, the other side of it, there's hundreds of pieces of work kind of all over that you can kind of go and read and, and soak in. So the ho- the whole of Khan was just like that, I guess. I think that's, that's brilliant. There, there's so much, I think, that you've brought to life for people who may be wondering what the job is, what it's like working in industry. And it's clear that it can be a lot of fun. It's an area you don't have to take yourself too seriously uh, in every moment of the day, even though the work and the impact is serious, especially in a lot of the health work that you're involved with. Um, you spoke as well about the creative process and the need to just keep going. If you've got the brief, you have to get to the end result, even if the first few or several ideas you're trying aren't working. And I think what I've really taken out of it as well is that it it is an accessible industry in that you can come from a multitude of different backgrounds. And if you've got that creative energy and that creative force and what you said, Marion, about just create your own content, get learning for yourself, have a body of work that you can show off as well. And especially younger talent coming through who might be very, very strong in certain aspects of social media. Just do more of it, create that content, come up with those ideas. So I think it's been really useful, really insightful and and really interesting. And just to wrap up, what we often try and do is to pass this baton of careers experience along. And I'm wondering if from from both of you, there's somebody else, whether in your sector or elsewhere, who you think because of their career, it would be really interesting to to unpick their journey for, for us to hear about, to learn from. And um, I, I was trying to think of who has the, the most interesting career. And I know a couple of funeral directors, and I just think that is psychologically a very interesting job to have to deal with families and grief, but logistically as well, the stories you hear about how they deal with the, the bodies and all that. So I, I don't know, it just seems like a very interesting career I would like to hear more about. That would be fascinating. We've certainly never had somebody on from from that line of work, definitely. And and Joe, from your side. I don't think I took this question seriously enough because I just thought of a stuntman or a stunt woman because I'd be interested in interested in what them what got them into throwing themselves around and nearly dying every day to be honest so i guess it's the other side of the funeral director i, I think that's brilliant i hope there's not a connection between being a stuntman and then having a, a funeral director interview but we haven't done either of those two so i think that's brilliant thank you both very much uh joe marion thank you so much for uh unwrapping your careers with us it's you've still got a lot further to go obviously but it's been really interesting learning about this aspect of the creative industry, the creative process, and your your success so far, particularly the Kansi Young Alliance. So thank you very much. Thank you both very much for coming on. Thank you very much. It's been great. Thank you so much. This podcast is sponsored by We Are Futures. To find out more about We Are Futures and how we can introduce your brand, business, or organization to the mass markets of tomorrow, visit www.wearefutures.com. Make sure to search for Careers Unwrapped in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Remember to click subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at We Are Futures, thanks for listening.